Today on Let the Bible Speak. It seems like nearly everybody drinks today and more people admit to recreationally using drugs. So what does the Bible teach about Christians and these substances? And welcome to Let the Bible Speak. It's so good to be with you today to look into the Word of God and see what it teaches about the issues that confront us. Our subject today is in response to one of our viewers who requested that we address the issue of Christians and alcohol. Drinking and now drug use are commonplace in our society, and it seems an increasing number of those who profess to be Christians are drinking alcohol and arguing for the use of drugs such as marijuana. It's certainly legal for people of a certain age to drink, and more states are legalizing the use of certain drugs, with many pushing for the lifting of even more limits. But I want to make it clear today, this is not a legal issue so far as we here are concerned. It's also not an issue of Christians imposing a moral standard on non-believers. I'm not concerned about that today. Rather, I'm approaching our subject from the perspective of those who claim to follow Jesus Christ. Does the Bible teach that it's wrong for Christians to consume beverage alcohol and recreationally use drugs? Our scripture reading today will be found in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, where the Apostle Paul wrote, And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Well, we'll look at this passage and several others in our study today, Alcohol, Drugs, and the Christian, after a song from the congregation. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tends his skies with every dew and frames the worlds with his great mind. There is a God, there is a God, he is alive, he is alive. in him we live in him and we survive. And we survive. Use of alcohol and even drugs is rather common in our culture today. I should begin by pointing out that alcohol and mind-altering drugs have been around since near the dawn of time. But in our modern world, most of the stigma that surrounded alcohol just a few generations ago, and as I say now even drugs, is quickly being removed until a majority of people from all walks of life, all ages, not only drink, but do so rather openly. Since the young people in the 1960s have come of age and have produced even younger generations, attitudes are quickly changing about recreational drug use, such as marijuana. According to the 2018 National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which is an annual survey, 86% of people aged 18 or older say they have consumed alcohol at some point. 70% have done so in the past year. When the survey was taken, more than a quarter of all adults in the United States admitted to binge drinking. Well, those numbers are easy to believe since you see alcohol being consumed in most social settings today. You don't have to go to a back alley bar to see people consuming alcohol and to witness the party scene revolving around alcohol. Uh, even restaurants such as Cracker Barrel and some fast food restaurants began serving alcohol in recent months and years. In fact, the use of alcohol is now so common and so accepted that you're seen as very strange if you don't ever imbibe it. 
and drugs are following a similar trajectory. According to the CDC in 2019, some 48 million Americans claim to have used marijuana. We're seeing more states and municipalities loosening restrictions and the sale of it is no longer something taking place in a darkened alleyway, but in businesses along the highways and byways of these states. And you shouldn't doubt that other drugs will be destigmatized and even legalized in time. And of course, we're seeing the epidemic of drug addictions and overdoses, especially when it comes to prescription drugs, such as painkillers. That's becoming quite an epidemic. We're becoming a society. Simply put, we're becoming a society that is either drunk on alcohol or high on drugs, and the effects of it filter right down through our society and are wreaking havoc on minds, bodies, families, careers, hopes, and dreams, and souls. The Bible unequivocally warns of such effects and condemns drunkenness as a sin. If a person claims to be a Christian and believes it's all right to get drunk or high on drugs, well, they're simply ignoring what the Bible plainly says or they're unaware of what the Bible says. In the Old Testament, for example, we have numerous warnings about drunkenness. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. And then in Proverbs 23, verses 31 and 32, Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. The New Testament even more plainly condemns drunkenness, such as in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11, where Paul lists drunkards or people who become intoxicated along with several other sins of the flesh, and he flatly says that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now that's not my opinion, that's the word of God. Paul says that drunkards, and that's the Greek word methusos, which means to become tipsy or intoxicated, according to both Strong and Thayer, Paul says those who do so without repentance will not be saved. So a drunkard is not necessarily talking to somebody who's laying out in the back alley whose life is completely spun out of control. Drunkenness is someone here who is under the influence of intoxicants. A drunkard cannot live a Christian life without repenting of his or her sin and ceasing to become intoxicated, according to Paul. Now, if Paul didn't teach that, he didn't teach anything. So why is drunkenness wrong? Why is the Bible so against it? One reason set forth in the scriptures is that it takes a sober mind to serve the Lord and thus remain in control of one's thoughts, speech, and actions. You can't serve the Lord if you don't remain in control of your heart and your mind and your body. I want you to listen to a series of passages that exhort and admonish the Christian to always maintain a sober mind. Paul, when he reminded the Thessalonian church of the approaching day of the Lord, he said in 1 Thessalonians 5, beginning in verse 5, You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now Paul here is simply warning that sobriety is necessary to please the Lord and to avoid His judgment. Now the Greek word that Paul used, which is translated sober there and in other passages, is the word napho. Vine says that it means, it signifies to be free from the influence of intoxicants. Now that same word is used in other passages and in very similar contexts. Peter, for example, in 1 Peter chapter 1, said beginning of verse 13, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. And listen to his dire warning in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. He says, Be Sober. Again, that's, that's a commandment. Be sober. And it's the same Greek word. Free of intoxicants. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion 
seeking whom he may devour. Now you see, the devil looks for opportunities to work in our lives and to lead us into sin and into all manner of mayhem and ultimately into destruction. And friend, I don't know of anything that he has used down through the stream of time to get man into more trouble than alcohol. I mean, take a tour of the Old Testament and see how strong drink has got some otherwise good men at times into some serious moral trouble, including Noah who became drunk and that situation caused his family to go into sin. There's Lot whose daughter, after they had fled from Sodom's destruction, got her father drunk. And you remember what happened? She led him to commit incest with her. And an evil nation descended from that son uh, born to that illicit union, the Moabites. They were menaces to the people of God down through the ages. You only need to casually glance at a newspaper or look to the headlines of your daily news feed to see all of the trouble that alcohol and drugs gets men, women, boys, and girls into every single day. The sexual sin, the violence, the terrible accidents that all spring from drunkenness or people who are high on drugs. Drugs and alcohol have destroyed so many lives physically, mentally, morally, spiritually, until it's incredible to me that anyone claiming to follow Christ would not at least agree that drunkenness is sinful and destructive and a Christian should not be guilty of it. At the last it bites like a serpent and it stings like a viper, the wise man said. And Peter says, if you want to keep the devil from destroying your soul, you need to remain sober and vigilant. But the question now is, what about drinking in, quote, moderation? What about social drinking or casual and limited recreational drug use, which is becoming more and more acceptable today. Can a Christian drink as long as he doesn't become what people would define as intoxicated? Or can a person use drugs as long as he or she doesn't become addicted or lose control of his or her actions? Well, we need to ask the question, what is drunkenness according to the Bible? Now, for a child of God, that's the standard. It's not what the law of the land says. That, that doesn't matter. It's not what a doctor says. It's not what a breathalyzer test may reveal. So far as our investigation today, so far as the Christian's relationship to God, the Word of God needs to define that. Does the Word of God tell us what drunkenness is? And if so, that should be the standard for a person who's trying to please the Lord. Let's look at our text again, found in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. Paul says, and do not. Now you don't find a plainer way of stating a command or prohibition in the Bible. This isn't a suggestion. He commands, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Dissipation. Now I'm reading from the New King James Version. The Old King James Version uses the word excess. And some people may say from that, we'll see what Paul is saying is, do not be drunk with wine because that would be wine in excess. But that's not what the word means. The word simply means a life of debauchery or dis dissipation. What Paul is simply saying is do not be drunk with wine. It's a good way to throw your life and ultimately your soul away, but rather be filled with the Spirit. A Christian, in other words, is not to be under the influence of strong drink, but rather at all times under the control and influence of the Spirit of God. Now the word drunk translates the Greek word that Paul wrote, methusko. Paul said, do not be methusko with wine. We should note that Paul did not use a word denoting a state or a final condition. He used a Greek verb, an inceptive verb, which means according to W.E. Vine, to make drunk or to grow drunk. He says it's an inceptive verb marking the process of the state to become intoxicated. You see, Paul used a verb that refers to an action or a process, not a destination or a final state. Well, when and how does that process begin? Well, I contend it begins when one starts to drink. Now the effects of alcohol, especially modern day alcohol with its alcoholic content, the effects of alcohol actually began when consumption begins. It's just not as obvious as it is at the end of a person keeps drinking. It's not something that suddenly appears. Intoxication is not something that suddenly appears after an extended time of drinking. It is a sometimes slow 
process that incrementally begins when a person starts drinking and gradually increases from one level to another. And one of the reasons that alcohol gets so many people into so many bad situations and drugs are the same way is because it has a subtle effect on the mind and body, lowering inhibition, slowing reflexes, dulling the senses, often relaxing control over one's thoughts, words, and actions, and that opens the gateway. People think that drunkenness is reaching a point that a person exhibits extreme effects and totally loses control or passes out. But friend, drunkenness is a process set in motion long before one reaches such a point. Even low concentrations of alcohol began to cause physical and mental changes. According to some experts, within five to ten minutes of a first drink, changes begin taking place in blood pressure and body temperature, concentration, and as the person continues to drink, uh, the process can progress to dizziness and impaired vision and decreased coordination and the speech becomes slurred, lowered inhibitions. A person becomes uh, less aware of what's going on and he is losing control, decreased coordination, mood swings, ultimately physical sickness. It can finally lead to unconsciousness and ultimately lead to death. Now my question is, if drunkenness, according to Paul, is a condition, at what point is that condition reached? If Paul's talking about a state that one reaches, what is that state? Shouldn't a Christian who's interested in remaining sober, as the Bible commands, simply avoid the process? Can't we all agree that a person is not intoxicated by alcohol if they haven't taken the first drink of alcohol? Now I know there are many, many arguments put forth and objections that are offered to what I have just pointed out. For example, one may ask, Didn't Jesus turn water into wine, and doesn't the surrounding narrative indicate that He's talking about fermented wine? Well, my answer to those questions is yes, and not necessarily. Jesus absolutely did turn water into wine, and it's recorded in John the second chapter. But you see, the word wine does not always refer to alcohol. The context has to determine that. There are, if my count is correct, 16 words in the Hebrew and Greek scriptures which can be translated wine. And only one of those refers exclusively to fermented wine. That's the word sobe. All of the other words can and often do refer to unfermented grape juice. Now the word used in John chapter 2 and verse 9 to refer to what Jesus miraculously provided is the Greek word oinos. And that's the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word yein. And both terms are generic for the juice of the grape either before it ferments or after it ferments. The Bible calls grape juice wine. Now yes, sometimes those words refer to fermented wine, but not always, not necessarily. In fact, in many places, especially where it's called new wine, it does not refer to alcoholic wine. It can even refer to other products made from grapes. Numbers chapter 6 verses uh, 3 and 4 and Jeremiah 40 and verse 10 are just two examples. You see, the context determines which use is under consideration. So Jesus could have turned water into grape juice or intoxicating wine according to the word itself, oinos. Which is it? Well, context has to determine that. Circumstances have to, have to determine that. Now, friend, think about it. Would the Son of God, who lived without sin and who came to deliver people from their sins, not tempt them with it, would He become a glorified bartender at a celebration? Now we've already shown that the Word of Christ condemns drunkenness, which is a process. It also condemns drinking parties. And we're to believe that Jesus provided a party of wedding guests with intoxicating drink? Well, I don't believe that. Now when it's said in John 2 and verse 10 that usually the best wine is brought out first and then the inferior wine, people oftentimes infer from that that he means once a person gets drunk he doesn't care so much what kind of wine he's drinking. But that's not necessarily what that refers to. It can just as easily refer to the senses becoming accustomed to the taste of something as much as it could any intoxicating effect. The first bite of some delectable food is usually the most impressive and overwhelming. Then we slowly become desensitized to it. The same can easily be said of the drink that Jesus miraculously provided on that occasion. There's nothing in the text 
that states that he changed it into fermented, intoxicating wine. And it's dangerous to give license to something that the Bible so emphatically warns us about by attributing to Jesus something the Bible doesn't necessarily say that he did. And then there are the qualifications for elders and deacons given in 1 Timothy chapter 3. In verse 3 of that passage, Paul commands that elders not be given to wine. And then in verse 8 he says that deacons are not to be given to much wine. Now many allege that Paul is allowing deacons to drink in moderation and placing an even greater restriction on elders. But because Paul uses a slightly different phraseology doesn't necessarily mean that he's applying two different standards. There are different ways of saying the same thing. There are, as we will see in a moment, by the way, situations where the use of alcohol is permissible, but not for social or recreational reasons. Paul is not allowing the deacons to enjoy a few beers with the boys, nor, nor is his prohibition for church leaders a license for everyone else in the church. Uh, for example, elders are not to be covetous. Does that mean the rest of us can be? Uh, elders are not to be violent and hot-tempered. Does that mean the rest of us can blow our stack and not have self-control and that be okay with the Lord? Well, of course not. Paul is simply emphasizing a Christian virtue that we are to make sure as we seek out our leaders, make sure they are living according to those standards themselves before we allow them to lead the rest of us. Now, I mentioned that there are situations where the use of alcohol is permitted. Paul addresses that in his first letter to his young son in the faith, Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 23, he writes, No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. And calling to mind the physical illnesses Timothy was dealing with, Paul permits him to use a little wine in treating his condition. Now that implies that Timothy did not drink wine until Paul gave him such permission by divine inspiration. Now, we know that alcohol and other drugs that have effects on the mind and body have long been used to dull pain and to treat various ailments. Paul's allowance here shows first that Timothy did not otherwise use wine. This was an exception being made by Paul. And today, that would apply in this way. A doctor will prescribe someone suffering from some injury or pain-inducing illness a painkiller. Those painkillers can have mind-altering effects and if used for other purposes can be dangerous. If a person is suffering from the flu or a cold, a doctor might recommend he take a medicine or cough syrup that contains alcohol. That medicine may ease the symptoms and help the person rest. If a person undergoes surgery, we put him under or her under anesthesia. Does that make it right for a person to use painkillers for recreational reasons? Or to take medicine to enjoy a high or a buzz? Well, of course not. God created those things and we are allowed to use them for that kind of wholesome, limited purpose. But even then, the greatest of caution must be exercised and we rely on a doctor's prescription, advice, and oversight to make sure that a person doesn't take too much or become addicted. It certainly is not a license for a Christian to use such substances simply because he or she wants to experience some euphoric state or have their troubles taken away or escape or whatever the case may be. Now, so much more can be said, but I want to ask you a serious question. Why drink? Why drink? With all there is to drink in the world today, why drink alcohol? Do you say, well, to have fun, to loosen up and have a good time? Well, my friend, listen to Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning of verse 3. He says, For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties he says, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Evil, uh, evil company corrupts good habits. Now, if you have to pick up a glass of alcohol or do some drug to be sociable or have a good time, what crowd are you running with? Where are they leading you? Why drink? Is it to take away problems? The Christian is to turn to Christ and His Word, His forgiveness, His promises, His peace for comfort and direction in life, not a bottle. Christ is our refuge in this troubled world, not a glass of alcohol. My dear friend, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a biologist. I'm not a psychologist or sociologist. But I know this one thing. I can say it with all the confidence in the world. 
A person who does not drink will never become an alcoholic. And the same is true with drugs. And with all the warnings in God's Word, with all the broken lives, wrecked homes, and shattered dreams, shouldn't we as Christians be running away from it as opposed to turning to it? Reading now I love to proclaim it. Reading by the blood of the Lamb. Reading the risen blood of mercy. His child and forever I am. Reading, 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 reading. Reading by the blood of the Lamb. Reading, 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 reading. His child. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. I'm so glad today you've joined me for our study of the Word of God. If you'd like to have a free printed transcript of today's lesson on alcohol, drugs, and the Christian, we'll be glad to send it to you. It's free of cost. Be sure to ask for it by that title, and we'll get it on its way as quickly as we can. Uh, don't forget, you can find past broadcasts, transcripts, and videos at our website, ltbstv.org, or our YouTube channel. And be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast if you want to listen to the program anytime, anywhere. Thank you for joining us for Let the Bible Speak today. I hope you'll tell someone else about us and plan to meet us back here, if the Lord wills, for another time of Bible investigation next week. Until then, I hope you have a great week ahead, and may the Lord richly bless you. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by The Church of Christ. For more information, including our past broadcast and sermon transcripts, visit ltbstv.org. Thanks for being with us today. Join us next time for Let the Bible Speak.